Hey physics kids, Campbell here. Oh my gosh, this is our last video of the year. So exciting. In our last video, we're gonna talk about applications of nuclear physics. And on another note, sub, 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 atomic particles. Now, you need to know the difference between a fission reaction and a fusion reaction. Fission, we're splitting apart. And so what happens is a neutron will interact with a fissionable nucleus, uranium is a good example, causing it to split. So here's my uranius, uranius, <laughs> uranium. We hit it with a neutron and we split into two heavy nuclei. So one product is two heavy nucleotides. Um, one is actually always heavier than the other. So here's um, barium and krypton. I also produce a bunch of neutrons and the average is 2.43 neutrons per reaction. So somewhere between two and three every time. Now this starts a chain reaction, right? Now that I've got more neutrons, right? They can interact with more uranium and produce more heavily nucleotides. So it's, it starts a whole chain reaction going. And of course, this produces a lot of energy. Um, we get a nice mass defect occurring here between the daughter nucleus and our neutrons that are ejected and where we started with the uranium and the neutron. Energy! And in fact, that produces 20% of our electrical energy. Um, here, in fact, is a map of where um, licensed facilities are to operate. That doesn't mean they're all operating, um, but that's where they are. Only one in Missouri, right there. Fusion, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. We're taking particles and we're putting them together. And so in a fusion reaction, we're taking hydrogen atoms, which are low on that binding energy per neutron um, graph, and we're forming helium, which is much higher on that graph. And this produces a lot of energy. In fact, it's the same type of reaction we used in our hydrogen bombs. Um, and it also is what powers the sun. Now it's cleaner, it's more efficient, it's safer, right? Because we are not producing radioactive waste. We are actually producing helium and energy and a neutron. Um, now the problem is though, is that in order to get these hydrogen atoms together, we need very high temperature, over a hundred million Kelvin and very high pressure. So there's a lot of hurdles to get over to get this to happen. But there are two types of designs. One uses magnetic fields. And there's a project in France using a magnetic, it's called a magnetic confinement fusion reactor. And that's right here um, to achieve those high temperatures and pressures. But there's an, also another way, um, it's called inertial confinement. And that's at Lawrence Livermore Labs. They're experimenting with lasers and using lasers, concentrating lasers to achieve the same goal of fusing putting together hydrogen atoms and making helium. Now, we're not making energy this way yet, but we are getting darn close. Very exciting. I actually read an article about it over spring break. Yay. Now let's talk about some applications. There's a lot of medical applications of nuclear medicine. So nuclear physics is good. One is radiation therapy. Um, so they use radiation therapy uh, to destroy or shrink tumors. And they do that actually by using gamma rays. And they allow gamma rays to pass through the shield um, targeted specifically at the tumor. So that's one way to do it. But another way is actually to seed the tumor with some radioactive isotope. And they actually implant it in the tumor. So very interesting. Dang tumors. Nuclear imaging is also used to produce images of the body, right? We know x-rays are used to image bones, but nuclear imaging actually can image tissues. And in fact, we can use nuclear imaging um, to image active tissues. A good example is using a gamma ray camera. Um, if a patient will um, drink, get um, injected with a gamma emitting uh, compound, um, it gets taken up, uh, for example, this one gets taken up by bone tissue where there's active growth occurring and you can actually use it to image tumor growth. So the tumors, right, they're most actively growing of all your tissues uh, if you have a tumor. And so it gets taken up by the tumor and then we can use a gamma ray camera to actually locate them. 
Similar to that is PET scans. PET scans are positron emission tomography, and they use most typically a fluorine isotope that emits a positron. Remember, positron emission isn't very common, um, but this isotope will emit a positron and become oxygen. Um, it's a very quick process. The half-life is 110 minutes. Um, so, but this fluorine is used to create glucose or an analog of glucose, um, and that actually happens in the brain. And so it's a good way to image what's going on in the brain. So it gets concentrated in active brain regions, and they can do brain scans with it. Now, if you think about it, if I give you positrons, right, they're going to find your electrons because you got a lot of those. And they're going to eject gamma rays when they annihilate each other. All right? And those gamma rays, by conservation momentum, are going to be at 180 degrees to each other. And so a detector will be able to determine the line along um, where those gamma rays are being ejected. They'll be able to figure out where those positrons were taken up. Um, so, for example, it's a great way to image brain activity. And so if you hear something you're not familiar with, right, it doesn't stimulate your brain very much. But if you hear something you are familiar with, um, you can see that the brain becomes much more active. And so they get really nice scans of brain activity. Great for brain research. Now, totally different note. Let's talk about the sub-sub-subatomic particles. Now, every subatomic particle has an antiparticle twin. Right? An antiparticle twin will have an opposite charge, but the same mass. Right? We know that there are positrons, which are the antiparticle to an electron. There are antiprotons, and there are even antineutrons. How? How could that have an opposite charge? Well, it doesn't, right? because neutrons are neutral, um, but they're not the same. And then there are more, and you'll see that when we get to our very last slide. Now, we know that, we talked about this in modern physics, that when particles come in contact with their antiparticle, they annihilate each other, and they don't leave anything but energy behind, or they actually may be involved in making other particles. And in fact, that's what particle colliders do. Particle colliders use electric and magnetic fields to accelerate these particles and their antiparticles to really high speeds, and when they collide, they annihilate each other, and they can produce other really crazy particles. Now, these part, for example, some particle colliders, Fermilab has the Tevatron particle collider, but the big one is at CERN. Um, this is the Hadron Collider, and it's actually in between Switzerland and France. Um, but before they started this collider, they, people were afraid that the world was going to come to an end. We were going to produce this huge black hole. And... But that hasn't happened. And in fact, they're making great discoveries about the real structure of the nucleus and the Higgs boson particles and really cool, cool discoveries that wouldn't have been possible without being able to bring particles to such high speeds. Yay! All right, so back to subatomic particles. Let's talk about neutrinos. Neutrinos are actually a very abundant particle, and they're nearly massless, but they, and they only interact weakly with matter. In fact, they can pass through most matter. And so it took them a while to actually discover them. Um, they're represented by a V figures, right? Not speed V, but neutrino V. And there are three types. Um, there's the electron neutrinos, which are actually involved in the beta decay process. When I produce a electron or a positron in, in the beta plus emission, um, I actually am also producing neutrinos. Um, now, the neutrino actually was a way, was originally proposed by Wolfgang Pauli to explain the law of conservation of momentum and energy and angular momentum, spin, um, in the beta decay process. It just took a lot longer to prove they existed. Um, so a full description, which he proposed and has been validated, for a beta minus or a beta plus decay is that, remember, beta minus, we're taking a neutron and we're creating a proton and an electron. Well, we actually are also producing the anti-neutrino, an anti-electron neutrino, um, in this decay process. And in our positron emission process, or our beta plus emission, we're taking a proton, remember, and converting it into a neutron and a positron, and we are actually producing an electron neutrino. So pretty interesting. Now on to the final, final particles. Now, there are really only two classes of truly fundamental particles that can't be broken down into subunits. So remember I said protons are actually composed of quarks. 
But there are two types, the two classes are called leptons and quarks, and electrons fall into the class of leptons. They are a fundamental particle. And of course, everybody has an antiparticle. Um, here's my electron neutrino, which we produce in positron emission, and there's my electron antineutrino, which is produced in beta minus decay. Here are my muons, All right? Muons are kind of like electrons in that they have like, what is it, like 207 times the mass of an electron, with the same charge. Um, and of course they have neutrino versions. That's the second type of neutrino. And there's the tau particles and they also have a neutrino uh, equivalent. There's my third neutrino. Now, leptons are particles like the, the electrons and the neutrinos, but quarks, right? Quarks are truly fundamental particles that make up protons and neutrons. And remember I said they're up and down um, quarks. Well, there's also strange charms. What? Totally crazy. All right, so those are the subatomic particles, or what I like to call the subatomic zoo. And unfortunately, I don't have any WSQ questions for you. So just write me a summary, write me a question, and I'll see you in class.